Well, it was like a big spitfire, very powerful at the time, the time it came out. It was, uh, it was strange enough, it was built by uh, Ferry, uh, the, same, uh, the same aircraft company that built, but built the Barracuda. But it was a, a really powerful aircraft. It was the most, one of the fastest and most, most uh, uh, heavily armed single engine aircraft in the world at the time it came out. It flew about 300 miles an hour. It was a fantastic thing. Um, it had four um, forward firing um, guns which um, were, were rather large and it could carry a, bombs but it was absolutely a delight to fly it really was it was fabulous Well, it was a twin. It was a twin seat, um, low wing monoplane, tricycle undercarriage, of course. Um, you know, tail wheel and two main wheels. Uh, a Griffin engine, which was a f powerful development of the Merlin, uh, about two thousand horsepower. Uh, the pilot sat uh, up uh, on above the leading edge of the wing, had a good view all round. Observer sat in a glass house behind him. In between the two uh, was the fuel tank. Uh, the observer's cockpit was about... Well, it was a, comfort, a comfortable space to sit in and you had a rotating seat. You could actually turn round. There was... Um, there was a tube uh, uh, at the back of the cockpit through which you could release smoke floats and uh, things like that, markers. Uh, and you could um, turn to one side or the other to use a bearing compass. There were sliding panels in the Perspex uh, canopy, but uh, it didn't do to open them very much. <laughs> the canopy opened folded back and there were two hinges uh, one centre top and one halfway down and in front of you were the basic um, repeat instruments of the air speed indicator and altimeter and uh, and then the, the radio set and uh, the radar screen oh they were they were quite quick they had they cruised at 200 knots, a top speed of about 280. They had four cannon. Uh, about six months after I joined the squadron, they were fitted up to fire rockets as well, so they could perform a job as a ground attack, long range reconnaissance. They 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 had a role and a role which they could perform, I think, very efficiently. They weren't really a fast fighter, but on the other hand, they packed quite a clout. They could go at a fair speed but above all they were a very very good well designed plane the, wheel, the, um, the Barracuda you know people didn't like at all because the wings didn't stay on very often but um, the Firefly was, never gave us a moment's concern it's a great plane Firefly was interesting I never, never got very enthusiastic about the Firefly a lot of people loved it um, it was to me neither f one thing nor the other it was neither a fighter nor a you know, a bomber. Um, I suppose it inherited a bit from the uh, the previous ferry, uh, which the fleet arm had to fly as former ferry former. But you know, it was a dreadful aeroplane really, underpowered and so on. The no, Firefly was you know at the time very exciting. You know, it was the, the newest thing. You know, was, here was I being allowed to fly this aeroplane, um, and it it had a lot of good qualities. I mean, it had, it had much more power, which was lovely. Um, again, my my experience on it then, I flew it later when I came back from the Far East. I flew it at Arbroath quite a lot. Um, and it was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was good, actually. It was good. One was just excited at flying a, a new type, I suppose, really. Met, as so often, I think it was trying to do two things at once, I suspect. 
I mean, it was there, I think, initially to operate as a fighter, as well as being a fighter bomber. You know, so it was probably the, the original fighter bomber, which so often, as they so often did, fell between two stools. Um, it hadn't got the maneuverability uh, or speed of the, of a, that the fighter needed, and uh, it was all right, I suppose, for ground attack and so on. Um, it should have been all right for ground attack. It felt all right. Never, I never had to use it. I would say heavier. Um, didn't, it wasn't as sensitive on, on, the, on the control stick, I don't think. Uh, but it handled pretty well. But I, wouldn't, I don't think I would be mad about doing aerobatics in it. Whereas the Hurricane, you didn't hesitate. You said it seemed to be the right sort of airplane to do aerobatics. I don't know if I ever did aerobatics in a, in a Firefly, actually, without looking at my logbook. And I may have declared them anyway if I did. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it was terrific. I really enjoyed it. Um, <clears throat> it was a real plane, really. And it was so powerful. You, when you took off, you opened the throttle, and you could feel it in your back, you know. Oh, it was fabulous, yeah. Uh, it, there were, how can I explain it? It'd be like having a, uh, an Austin a Mini, a Mini uh, and, and, and getting into a uh, Rolls-Royce. And putting your foot down, or a Jaguar, or something like that, something powerful uh, that really responded when you put your foot down. When you opened the throttle, and it it really went like a bomb. You know, really terrific. It was fashion. The other thing was, of course, that to start with, because we were the old barracudes were sort of lumbering along, we weren't used to high speed. So <laughs> flying one of these things was, uh, you know, you were where was that? <laughs> And coming into land was also uh, much faster than it would have uh, been in a barracuda. But nevertheless, it, and of course you've got this huge um, engine in front of you, you couldn't, when you were taxiing, going along on the ground, you couldn't see over it. But, so you had to keep weaving as you did in a Spitfire, so you could see where you were going. And that was uh, that was a bit tricky at times, and if you weren't careful, there was someone in front of you, and you, you clip his tail with your propeller. No, we we were using headphones and um, headphone jacks. There was some um, intercom wiring, and it was powered by the radio set. And you had um you had a master switch on on your radio. You could either use use it as a Morse key or you could use it on intercom only or just broadcast. We were doing navigation exercises and uh, and we had a dual purpose uh, function as um, being able to attack ground targets. The aircraft carried um, eight rockets and um, so the pilots had to practice. I mean, you had to get the pilot to the right position and then he had to do, go into a, either a 20 degree or a 40 degree dive to attack uh, with the rockets. Well, I was appointed back to 700 Squadron to HMS Rodney and she was in Rosyth and for a month I did training with a new pilot called Sub Lieutenant Campbell. I knew most of what there was to know about the war, so really it was a bit marking time, and I wasn't very happy about it because there was no job to be done on HMS Rodney. The Spitfires had taken for D Day. The Spitfires took over f spotting for the fall of shot. There was really no job for a, a war on Rodney. So in the end, in February '44, they took the catapult off Rodney and I was sent home to wait another posting and then I got the posting I really did want which was to a Firefly Squadron 
Uh, that was on the 13th of April 1944, and believe it or not, I was so senior by then, losses had been such that I was appointed a senior navigator, which really was. I mean, it was a great job. Great crowd of chaps. Wonderful plane. Absolutely first-class CO called Major Cheeseman. And we went up to Hatsden to work up the train with this new plane, preparatory to joining Indefatigable, a new carrier. And those were very, very exciting days. We knew we had a job to do. We knew we had a good plane. And uh, all we wanted to do was get us as good as we could. We were the very first Firefly Squadron. And then eventually, in May 1944, we embarked on HMS Indefatigable. 1770, that's right. We were the very first Firefly Squadron. We had eight rockets. They, uh, they, were, they had 60-pound warheads, 60-pound heads, and they were fired like a... They, were, they, they went very quickly, and they, they had quite a bomb on the front, you know, quite a bomb on the front, which would blow up and wreck machinery in a pumping station and things like that. They were a new weapon... They were particularly efficacious against submarines because they used a solid head which pierced the submarine's casing. But they were also very good for ground attack. And I don't know who invented them, whether the Yanks did or we did. I have a feeling that we did. But uh, they, were, they added a very n another dimension to the capability of the Firefly, which was then a, a very good ground attack fighter as well as long-range reconnaissance. Now, we were asked what sort of job we'd like to do. And there was quite a variety. Um, and they were forming night fighter squadrons uh, with fireflies, which were the, the latest aircraft to come into the, to the fleet air arm, uh, carrying observers, that is, I mean, apart from single-seat fighters. And... Uh, four or five of us volunteered uh, to go on the night fighter squadron and we were all appointed to uh, 1792 it was Naval Air Squadron uh, again at Leon Solent it was a 24 aircraft squadron it was enormous oh, it was going to go operational as soon as it had finished training um, Somebody had decided that the the Japanese were picking off stragglers and um, people were coming back from from strikes in the twilight, and they were losing quite a lot of people that way, and so there was a need for a night fighter force um, to to intercept the the Japanese fighters. Um, I can't quite see it myself, but um, that's what we were told. And they formed two squadrons to do night, this night fighting. We had a special radar set called the uh, ASH set, which you could use actually for surface um, work. You could pick up a submarine telescope at 10 miles, I reckon, in a calm sea. Uh, or you could also use it for air-to-air air -air interception. It had a tiny screen, about twice the size of your recorder there. It was, it was one of the new, first um, centimetric radar sets. Um, it was evolved in the UK and, and then given away to the US. Where, who further developed it and um, but on it you could s see the blip and they and you could direct the pilot to turn or go up or down to bring the two blips in line
And uh, the most frightening part of being a Fleet Air Arm Air Crew is sitting on the deck waiting to take off. There's this terrific roar of noise. The, sh the carrier turns round into wind. And you're sitting there with this, the squadron around you, you know, and this is when you really think, you know, is this the last flight I'm going to do? But after that, you're too busy. You know, you're, you're navigating, you're putting things on your chart, you're noting what you're looking, you're noting the time you go over certain headlands to make sure you know what your position is. And, you know, by and large, you're so busy, you haven't got time to think about the fear aspect of it. In fact, there's a sense of exhilaration while you're doing the attack. There's a sense of relief when you get back, too. But Firefly wasn't a difficult plane to land on. We, we didn't really... I mean, Cheeseman was such an expert pilot, we never picked up anything more than the second wire, whereas we never floated over. Whereas if you picked up the fourth wire, you invariably hit the barrier and wrote your, wrote your air screw off. But Cheese was very good, and most of our pilots were very good too. There were two wires behind the lift, four wires in front of the lift, and then you had barriers. So that if the plane was floating and likely it hit the planes that were parked on the bow of the ship, the, the barriers would stop it. And invariably they would break the air screw and possibly do some damage to the wings. Now it was the job of the batsman and the pilot to bring the plane down to catch his hook on the second wire because that was safe. If you hit the third wire, you were probably all right if there was a good wind over the deck. The fourth, fifth, and sixth wires were a bit dangerous. So, um, but our, our pilots were very good. We we had very little damage to the planes due to accidents on the deck, whereas the Spitfires really, the Spitfire was a devil to land on, and um, they were forever breaking the un breaking the undercarriage. On the other hand, we had to push ourselves to the limit. I mean, we had planes that we were supposed to fly very low when we were shadowing so that we weren't picked up by the ship's radar. And occasionally a plane would dip his air screw in the water and break three inches off it. And as we were short of air, air, air screws, this was, this was a heinous crime. Uh, an aircraft, <clears throat> when you cut the power down, it, it slows down and it gets to a certain point where it loses it, its ability to fly. It stalls and you have to learn how to cope with it, it when it stalls. And each, each aircraft, each type of aircraft has a different pattern or some of them just a, a swordfish this biplane, this swordfish, it would uh, fly ever so slowly and then when it did stall its nose would drop a bit and then it would pick up a bit of speed and it would be airborne again. So it was ever so easy to handle. Uh, but if something like a barracuda stalled, it just twizzled around and spun around and that was it. You had a difficulty to stop it. The firefly, it too, uh, would, it was relatively easy to control. If it started to, to come into a spin, you opposite opposite uh, uh, rudder and, and uh, you, you, the technique is you, you, you put the stick over one way and the, press the rudder the other way and it stopped the spin and then you pulled it out of the spin and it become airborne again. So that was relatively easy. But you had to know you, you, you couldn't just land on a ship at high speed because it, it would, your, your hook would would uh, perhaps catch on the wires, the rest of the wires and break and so you couldn't go on too fast, you had to learn and slow flying, you get that feel, you're flying along and you feel this almost about to stall and it's not going to because you won't let it. So you had to practice that <clears throat> and quite often <clears throat> practicing it, you know, you did stall, so you had to do it from a, a fair height in case. So there were all those little things you had to learn.
the on the way back to uh, Ceylon, the fleet split up into two into two uh, task forces to do exercises with each other, and the fireflies were shown up, flown off from Indefatigable to do their primary fleet role, which was long range reconnaissance. And it fell to Cheese and I to make the sighting of the enemy fleet. We uh, sent back the enemy enemy report, and then more, I think, by luck than good judgment, the squadron did a the squadron took this message, so they all knew where the, the enemy fleet was, the, the exercise enemy fleet, and then we all closed in. And as luck would have it, we all closed in about the same time to strafe the flight deck because there was a flight. There were planes um, on the Victorious, it was. And then Cheese and I stayed, and we shadowed for an hour and a half. That is, you, what you do is you um, take cloud cover, you get down very low, you go out, you come back in again, uh, and eventually we were picked up by Corsairs. And I um, always remember it very well, because eventually the Corsairs picked us up, which really meant that we were, we'd were failed. You know, We'd been picked up by the fleet we were shadowing, and we'd have been shot down. But uh, they kept on making passes at us. And um, Cheese fought the plane very well because we had very good flaps. And you could go very slowly in a firefly, actually, because you put your flaps down and go very slowly so that the uh, the, the um, fighters had difficulty in getting a bead on you. And I always remember Cheese saying, go away, silly boys, on their frequency. And then they pushed off back. And then we started to fly back to the carrier. Got back to the carrier using my own navigation, I'm proud to say. We found the ships quite easily. In fact, I remember she saying to me, is ETA, where's the fleet? And I said, there they are down below you. Oh, he said, well done. So that was full marks. And then we were, we'd were been in the air then for four and a half hours. And we were just about to land on and a Spitfire crashed on deck. So we were waved off. And we ran out of petrol. Now, the saving grace was Major Cheeseman had been a warless pilot. And there's a technique in landing a plane on the water, which you only know if you've flown a flying boat. You sort of motor in and hold the plane on its propeller and motor it in tail down so that the tail takes the first impact with the water and then you sort of bounce like a, a bouncing stone. Anyway, rarely Cheese did it so well that a destroyer called the Wakeful was alongside us before we even had to get out of the plane to get ourselves wet. And they threw down a climbing rope and we went on the Wakeful. And we thought, now that's very nice. We're going to have a, a nice restful time until we get back to harbour. But not so. The Wakeful was ordered alongside Indefatigable. They put the crane over with an ammunition tray. And we got on this ammunition tray and we were back on board our ship within an hour of force landing in the water. I have to have to admit reluctantly that um, I got my number taken by King George the Sixth, actually, over Balmoral Castle. <laughs> I, I, I had a, um, in fact, it was my last, it was my last trip with that squadron because I was grounded after that. But I had a um, Canadian under training signals officer, a Canadian RC, RCM signals chap, in the back. And we tended to fly a lot over the highlands. Um, and I think we would, I don't know what exercise we were supposed to be doing that day, probably ash or something. Um, yes, it was ash homings, I see it was called, uh, the exercise. So we were teaching them to use the radar. And I looked down and said, oh, that's Balmoral Castle. Do you want to see it? This was in a firefly, not an Anson, I hastened to which was much more fun. Uh, so he said, sure, yeah. So anyway, we, I, I then shot across Bal the top roof of Balmoral Castle at very low level. I mean, again, because I was mad at that stage, a low fly, very low. So it must have been quite noisy in the castle. And apparently the king was in council or something. 
and um, he then rushed out with his two daughters in, into the um, porchway, looking onto this lovely sward of, of grass. And then I committed the unforgivable crime, which I ought to have realised from my operational training, was a thing you never did, which I did a 180-degree turn, having crossed the, crossed the roof. And then I did a 180-degree turn and came back across the lawn, again at naught feet, uh, with the result that the king, out in the porch with his two daughters, uh, not only saw me, but actually could see the number. And it wasn't just the, the large number on the side, but he read the small numbers by the tailplane, which indicates that we were fairly low and fairly close. Anyway, that from that when I got back, signals were flying around the whole of the Scottish command, saying, "Please report aircraft number, uh, what was it, MR758, um, which was seen low flying over Balmoral Castle. D did you have such an aircraft airborne at whatever the time was?" Um, in fact, it, he identified it as a Seafire or Spitfire. So the King's uh, um, aircraft identification wasn't terribly good, but unfortunately he had the number right. So, of course, all mayhem was let loose at our breath. I mean, I was under instant uh, close arrest. No, not close arrest, open arrest. In other words, I was not allowed to leave the, the premises. The poor old uh, RM captain, I think, probably was wetting his pants over the whole thing. Uh, anyway, um, I was duly interviewed, of course, had to admit that I had been, <laughs> been over <-bound> moral. <laughs> um, and the poor fellow who was in the back with me, and so he, in the first instance, was being treated as though he was captain of the aircraft. Unfortunately, we were able to sort that one out that he wasn't. <laughs> anyway, I was, uh, long and short of it was that I was grounded instantly, of course, and I was then sent to Stretton, uh, which was a naval airfield, uh, to look after German and Italian prisoners of war, which I thought was a good punishment for my last two months in the Navy. <laughs>